Is my sound coming through okay? Yeah, we are broadcasting live. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is John Harry. I'm the Programs Fellow at the Milwaukee County Historical Society. It's Thursday night at 730. That means it's time for another one of our uh, digital discussions. Um, tonight we have a really cool one about the history of the Falk Brewing Company and uh, what Mobcraft Brewing has done with their historic yeast. So it's uh, we've been building it as beer history meets science uh, tonight because uh, it's, it's going to be an in-depth look at, at both things um, as far as uh, uh, how you get that cultivating that historic yeast as well as the history of Falk Brewing Company, and which I feel is overshadowed a lot by the big breweries of Milwaukee's past. So I um, want to let you know next week uh, we have actually two talks. So another kind of beer related one on Tuesday that I'll be giving um, on the People's Brewing Company. Um, they were a black owned brewery um, out of Oshkosh, but they're from Milwaukee. And so we're going to be talking about People's Brewing Company on Tuesday night. And then on Thursday night, uh, we're partnering with the Encyclopedia of Milwaukee and their director, Joe Walzer. Um, and we're going to be talking about the origins of Summerfest, because if you can believe it, it was supposed to be Summerfest next week. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, where, where the idea for Summerfest came from in the first place next Thursday night. So Tuesday and Thursday next week. Keep an eye on uh, uh, our Facebook and, and social media places to uh, find out more about that. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk beer. It's a Thirsty Thursday kind of presentation. Uh, we've got um, awesome uh, presenters tonight. Uh, we have Wisconsin Breweriana historian Dave Olson as well as Mobcraft brewmaster extraordinaire Andrew Gearzak uh, to talk about Falk Brewing. So I'll let you guys take over. I'll, I'll be here to help at the end with questions, but it's, it's your show from here on out. Right. Thank you, John. <clears throat> I'm Dave Olson. And again, I have a passion for the Falk Brewery, and I thought I would share that with John. I think these presentations are great. Um, I also have an interest in brewing, as Andrew will attest. I work part-time for Mobcraft, and we're gonna have some fun with you today. But first, let's start with my obsession with the Falk Brewery. The uh, years before Prohibition, there was another Milwaukee brewery that few people have heard of, and it was very comparable to Blatt's, Schlitz, Pabst, uh, and it was even at, it, at its heyday, it was bigger than Miller. Uh, but not many people here in Milwaukee are aware of it, even though we all drive by it daily if we use I-94 West. And this Falk Brewing Company heavily influenced lager beer brewing here in Milwaukee for a period of over 50 years. And it really helped uh, create this idea of this export that Milwaukee had of Milwaukee lager. And Rather than go into a biographical date by date kind of presentation, I'm going to try and use some of the images that I have of Falks Bruriana and kind of go through the history list. If you want a more detailed article type of presentation of the Falk Brewery history, it's available at my website, wisconsinbrewerianna.com. Now, let's start right off with the man himself, Franz Falk. Uh, arrived in America in 1848, and he it was trained in his youth as a cooper, and then he did a stint as a brewer in his uncle's brewery. Uh, he grew up in Mitt Mittenberg, Germany, uh, so that's Bavaria, and other uh, famous brewers you may have heard from that area include August Krug, who eventually started Schlitz, and uh, Val Valentin Blatz. So uh, Franz Falk came over, uh, first took a job. He was about 24 years old, working for Krug. And August Krug, uh, when he passed away, uh, the brewery became uh, Schlitz. And that's the start of Schlitz Brewery. So Franz Falk was involved in the really early years, in the late 1840s. Um, and then he started to work for another gentleman, uh, who had the Neukrich German Brewery, which was really founded by Simon Rutenschoffel uh, in 1840. Um, 1840 is a big year in immigration of brewers to Milwaukee. Um, in Bavaria, state records on immigrations to America, Simon Rutenschoffel is listed in the top line on an important government document as a brewmaster who came to America. 
And the Germans in the real early 1840s and late 1830s were all suffering a little bit from too much uh, or not enough uh, crops, uh, drought, a lot of issues going on in Germany that made them want to come and strike out and, and create a new life in America. And a lot of them knew each other or talked amongst themselves uh, by writing letters back home. Now, when Franz Falk uh, signed on, the Newcritch German brewery eventually went to Newcritch's son-in-law, C.T. Melms. Uh, C.T. Melms is considered to be one of the first brewmasters in Milwaukee who made it big. Uh, he's the first beer baron, if you will. And he started a huge brewery in the Menominee Valley, which is actually just kitty corner across the street from where Mobcraft is. Um, the brewery was sized, the Melms Brewery, the Menominee Brewery, was sized at 150,000 barrels a year capacity when it was built. So it was a big brewer. And Falk worked there for about a decade, well, about six years, um, kind of crafting the Melms products, which became famous around the country, and especially in Wisconsin. Um, and... What Franz was doing is also on the side building up his bank account because he eventually wanted to go into business for himself. And one of the first things he did in Milwaukee in around 1855 is he uh, joined a partnership with Frederick Goes. And Frederick Goes and Franz Falk leased a chunk of the Eagle Brewery, as far as we can tell. Um, much the same as Mobcraft started out its history as Gypsy Brewers with House of Brews in Madison. Franz Falk and his partner were working out of this existing brewery on 8th and Chestnut. And that's really how his business started going or got going. Um, they also were uh, advertising themselves as malsters. And eventually, as part of this early uh, startup, uh, Falcon Ghost purchased some property on the west side of what is now the 29th and Pierce intersection against the South Menominee Valley Rim. And at that time, the only people that were out that far west of Milwaukee brewing was north of Menominee Valley, it was Miller. And Falk was yet a little bit further west, out on the sticks. And these guys located out there for a couple of reasons, one of them was cost, one of them was, or cost avoidance, we could say. Another one was uh, availability of land, um, also the right kind of land. Um, the Falk site eventually had the right conditions where they could make some good beer cellars. And Miller, as you know, has caves they were able to chip into the limestone. But these brewers were starting out on the west side of town so that uh, people who were bringing their goods to market, hops, barley, uh, the brewers could intercept them west of the city before the farmers made it to market. So Falk was one of the early brewers that got onto that bandwagon, similarly as uh, Mr. Miller did. Uh, Falk, again, in German means falcon. So you see a lot of their early depictions of their letterheads and stuff have a nice falcon on the top of it. Uh, by 1856, Goes and Falk reported brewing uh, about a thousand barrels that year. And they were, were leasing in this, uh, what's called the Sand Spring Brewery, up uh, not too far away from the, probably like right in between where Pabst and Schlitz complex are today. Yeah, I always think this is an interesting graphic. There's not many of them of that era. Uh, but I like the five different types of carriages that are hauling beer around. And I especially like those wooden kegs that are uh, so big, you can only get three of them on the beer wagon. So as we move into the 1860s, um, there is uh, some breweriana that's available. Um, one of them is this Civil War token. Uh, as we got closer to the Civil War, these tokens were issued to be used in lieu of currency because currency was really needed for the war efforts. And Falcon Goes, uh, one of their earliest uh, things that you can find is this uh, Civil War token coin. It's about the same size as a penny, but it's got some really great information on it. Um, and again, they had bought this sect 
or of land, which um, is this image on the right side. Um, and at that time, you know, the Menominee Valley still had the river running through it. Um, and it was a lot different terrain back then. You can see the few brewery buildings that are built in that plat group. Um, another thing, I put this image up of these brewers because I see it frequently referred to as 1863 Falk Coopers. Um, you can tell by the lithograph in front of these gentlemen that that's the Bavaria Brewery. It's not the brewery that was downtown. It's the established brewery probably in the 1870s, not 1860s. Um, but about 1866, Falcon goes, decided to split up their business with uh, Goes taking the uh, malt side of the business and Falk taking the brewing side. And the chunk of land uh, near 29th and Pierce became Falk's. In the 1870s, uh, 1870 specifically, Franz Falk built the first piece of this brewery. Um, he trenched out some beer cellars in to the Menominee Valley Wall on the south side. It is quite a steep hill there. And this cornerstone still exists today. Um, but this image that we used for the presentation tonight's uh, headline, uh, this is about 1872. Um, and again, this is a, an image that you'll see around that era when there's very few other uh, advertisements from them that have this much detail. But it's a great litho. And the two buildings just below the F in France are the uh, original uh, ice house, I'll call them for lack of a better word. And below the farthest one to the left is where the beer cellar entrance is. And after a few years, uh, Franz Fox starts to call this the Bavaria Brewery. Um, 1871, their first year, they did about 8,000 barrels of production. Um, and about 1877, you know, things were kicking in around the country. They had depots for the Bavaria Brewery uh, all over the United States by then. There's an image here from uh, Kansas. And they built a bottling house. And eventually this bottling house was taken over by a partner named A. Gunther. That was about 1877. Now this is an 1872 lithograph that's out there. It's just a little bit better color view of that previous black and white. And again, you can see the ice houses on the left and there's a racking room just below them. Uh, remember folks in this era, smokestacks with smoke coming out, that's coal color was popular sign of uh, vigorous industry, not pollution. It's kind of funny. And then in the lower part of this image, you can see what it looked like from the south. So this particular image, we're looking at the brewery from northwest, standing and viewing southeast, looking southeast. And here's another image about 1878. You can see next to those left two ice house buildings, they've built even bigger uh, building attached to that. It's a storehouse now and there's uh, aging uh, tanks and a lot of space to uh, take care of some of the brewing processes. This is actually from an 1878 plat book um, and it's kind of unique to see the artist's perception of what's going on in this era. You can still also get that idea of how far west of the city, the Falk Bavaria Brewery is. Uh, in the 1880s is a huge decade for Falk. Um, their new ice house was built um, at a cost of $50,000 in 1880s money. I believe that's uh, two and a half million in today's money. So that's a pretty big investment in ice, uh, but they were using 22,000 plus tons of ice in a year. And this uh, old fire map here, this is a Rasher's fire map. Real uh, quick, Dave, uh, where did all that ice come from? Well, many places, uh, not the Menominee River. Uh, a lot of that ice that they would get uh, would be harvested in the area lakes. So Pewaukee Lake is an example. Anything that was close to Milwaukee that they could 
that froze up. They would harvest that ice and pay people to bring it. And you can see now from the, the Rasher fire map, the, you know, the red or orange sections in this fire map are really brick. Yellow means uh, stick and frame or wood frame buildings. Um, there is some discussion that on the far right side in the far right bottom corner, this uh, yellow says keg storage. And we know there was a building over there, but this is, I'm going to show you this later with a GPR map, is right below where the brewery cellars used to reside. They came out of the first ice house, the oldest one, and went right underneath the brewery. Um, the brewery pieces here you can see in the fire map. We also see that they had a Cooper's uh, building, and the far left is the stables. And these stables were huge. Um, they had at one time up to 100 horses, and there were a lot of beer wagons going in and out of that. It's quite a huge facility for horse machinery and horsepower. Um, and again, you know, they started to think about expanding with the railroads. Um, they had their own railroad spur, which made shipping by railroad very easy for Falk. They were one of the earliest adopters to bottle beer and ship it across the nation. Everywhere the railroads went, it opened up new markets for the breweries. All of them adopted shipping beer, and it was always called Milwaukee Export. So that first type of lager beer brewing that's called Export is something all the breweries were doing, and Falk was very much a part of that. Um, there's some interesting notes as you look into the stories about Falk. Um, in 1886, the Gambrinus Labor Union, local breweries union, uh, went on strike. And the Falk brewery workers, uh, for the most part, were hesitant to go on strike with them. They actually liked their conditions and their pay and their hours. But the union actually had their whole force walk over to the Falk property and say, hey, we're striking. If you're with us, let's go. And they walked down to effectively Bayview. And the governor called out the National Guard. And there's a, a whole other history story about the six people that were shot in Bayview during the labor riots that year. Uh, and the Falk workers uh, initially didn't even want to be a part of it. Uh, but that's back to uh, the Falk leadership and how they treated their people. Um, in November, the Franz Falk Brewing Company, uh, in November of 88, 1888, merged with uh, two other brewers in town, uh, Young and Borkhart. And all three of these brewers merged because as you got further into the, close to the 1890s, there were a lot of worries about some European syndicates taking over. Uh, much the same as InBev and SAB have gone and bought up all the breweries around the world. There were UK syndicates that were buying up American breweries and consolidating them and harvesting their markets. Um, in 1889, however, there was a huge fire. Um, and it was very significant impact on the city. Uh, the blaze itself burned everything to the ground, just about, except for these brick buildings. The, Stables uh, had a scorched roof, um, and the, the stock house there uh, was brick. It got the bricks were a little bit scorched, but trees up to one block away from the center of the fire were scorched in, to the point where they died. Um, and there is uh, notices in the Milwaukee Sentinel and the and some of the other papers of the time nationally of these huge fire on July fourth. Uh, one of the things that happened is where the Border Botanical Gardens are uh, used to be National Park. And they used the electricity from the Falk Brewing Plant. And the Falk's uh, generator uh, died in the fire with the rest of the stuff. Um, and they, were, they had to do that year in 1889 by candlelight for the 4th of July celebrations. Uh, but the brewery was rebuilt. Um, and within a year, they were basically back in business and bigger than ever. And this is a 1882 picture here. And I put this up to remind me, uh, you can see on the far right, the original two brewery structures. And then you can see 
left of them, there's two, three more sections added on. Um, this building right in the foreground on the right is where that keg storage fire map was indicated. Um, but this is the kind of thing Falk would do back then for their accounts and favorite customers is to send them a, a card on uh, to wish them a happy new year and thanks for the business. Uh, but this year wasn't happy. 1882 is when Franz Falk passed away and his sons, uh, Louis and Frank Falk, took over the business. Now, nationally, Falk's beer was famous. Um, it was also internationally famous. So as you worked into the 1880s here, the, the export of Falk uh, was going everywhere in the nation. Chicago, Kansas, Denver, New Mexico, New Orleans, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, St. Louis, East Indies, the Sandwich Islands, that's Hawaii, Mexico, South America. Um, there are 125 Falk agencies in operation that we know of as of 1886, and about 25,000 barrels of beer were being bottled and exported every year. Um, there's some trade cards here on the left, and they kind of reflect different eras during the 80s of what the name of the company was. It's also in the Victorian era there, they were using children, uh, kind of symbolized purity when they were working on their sales cards. Um, probably not wouldn't fly today, certainly not. Um, they were trying to say, you know, everybody wants to get Falk beer. Uh, that's what that card in the middle on the bottom is kind of indicating. All hands reach for Falk is the caption. Uh, and then we see this ad. Um, remember in this era, the Germans were had a German market and they also had an American market or English speaking market. And you can see at the bottom of this German ad, you know, they're talking about their Chicago Depot, New Orleans, uh, several places around the country. Um, and in the 1880s, they uh, went out to California and they won the award for the best bottled beer, export beer in the Mechanics Institute contest. It was kind of like having a World's Fair, but it was American manufacturers. And it kind of ticked off the Californian uh, manufacturers of beer that someone from Milwaukee would win in their turf. Uh, likewise, they won another medal, I believe, in the same year uh, in the Australian uh, exhibition. So they were definitely international. Um, in this picture, I show these cards again, but I think you'll notice right away the, all the writing is in Espanol. So they heavily marketed to South America and to Mexico and everywhere. Uh, you know, they were after uh, Spanish speaking Americans as well as people outside of America that spoke Spanish. Um, they also started to, like many brewers did during uh, prohibition, pre prohibition, malt extracts were popular. Um, and I have this gentleman's picture up here. That's John C. Cutting. See, and he was the agent out in California who wrote up this trademark request for California to protect Falk's Milwaukee export beer uh, trademark. Well, what would happen in California if you said, I want a Milwaukee lager, they might just give you the California breweries version of a Milwaukee lager, which was brewed really poorly and tasted awful. Uh, you had to ask by it by name, and these trademark kind of infractions uh, angered the agents and Falk enough that they went, and in their most important markets, they did trademark applications like this with the government. So this particular entire letter is available out in the California digital online records. Uh, the picture in the middle here of this pedestal is from what I believe the 1878 Paris Exhibition because we have a Philip Best uh, piece of wood uh, display like this, nearly the same construction. And it would have been something compact that they could have taken to Paris, uh, shipped it easily and displayed their beer uh, and lobbied for awards with the beer taste tests. Uh, this is the only image of this that exists that I'm aware of. And boy, would I like to uh, hunt down and find that falcon finial on the top, all hand carved. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, 
I had a few tide houses as you get close to 1890. Uh, Puddler's Hall, which you'll all recognize here in Milwaukee, it's just south of the Three Brothers restaurant, uh, was a Falk tide house for one year, sorry, 1891. Um, this other building in black and white is called Behringer's Garden. Um, and that building is actually on West Pierce and still there. Uh, the left side of it is a VFW or a former VFW. Uh, that is a building I still haven't been able to get into. So maybe Bobby Tenzillo, if you're out there, let's see if we can go urban spelunking in the old Behringer Garden building before it disappears. Um, one thing you would see in a Tide House of any brewery is these corner signs on the left and the right side of that Franz Falk litho, there are two corner signs here. And they would typically put those pieces of artwork outside. They're tin and hand painted. There is a Philip Best set of the same images. So we know those images were what they call stock images to make corner signs. Uh, but these two Falk um, corner signs are the only two known that I'm aware of and they're in a private collection here in the Mequon. Uh, in, in any Tide House, that era in the 1890s, there really wasn't too much advertising. You'd see some corner signs and maybe a lithograph in a photo, I should say, in a nice framed up display like that. Uh, and in 1892, tragically, another fire broke out and it devastated the malt house. It started in the malt house again. That's where the previous fire started. And it basically shut down that new entity. Falk, Young, and Borkhart were formed in 1888, and they were in business till 1892, and that was kind of the end. Um, Pabst had been receiving offers from those UK syndicates. I heard a story, and I haven't substantiated it yet with any documentation, that Pabst was offered $10 million for his business in 1890, 1891, that frame. And he basically said, you know, go scratch. I don't need money. I have plenty of money. And he wouldn't sell his, his business. Um, but he looked at uh, the Falk uh, Company's second fire as an opportunity. Um, and one thing, i got to fast forward here, just one slide. There was a report in 1891 in Chicago Trib about Falk already being owned and controlled by the syndicates. 1891 is when they bought the Valentine Blatt's brewery out after Blatt's died. Um, and it looks like they had made a pitch for Falk and it was far enough along that the newspaper reported that it was complete. But Pabst restructured the brewery uh, ownership of Pabst, including shares for all of the Falk executives um, that wanted to be a part of it. And uh, money really didn't trade hands until later in the in the deal's structure, later in time frame. And by doing that, it really put Pabst over the top. Um, Herman Falk was the only Falk relative from that merger or purchase by Pabst that didn't end up going to join Pabst. He actually started what became the famous Falk Gear Company, which is now Rexnord. Um, and there's just a few more uh, Bruyana items here. Um, again, the 1888 map, you can see that they expanded the bottling house across the tracks in the Menominee Valley. Um, you can see that far top left building is where Falk Manufacturing first started to use some of that property. Uh, I believe Herman Falk rented it from Pabst. Uh, it's interesting in the fire maps. I haven't seen this in the fire maps before, but in the lower right area where the brewery was, it says runes of fire. So this was close enough where they included that. And then just to left of center on the bottom, there are two yellow uh, buildings. And the bigger one that's kind of like a plus sign is actually the Falk Mansion that's always been a part of the property and the Falk Mansion and this other building next to it on the left are still there surrounded by apartments. I'll be able to show you that in a second uh, aerial view. So this is kind of what the Falk Brewery looked like right before that last fire. Uh, there's two different depictions of it. And uh, I've always appreciated how much color and 
artwork went into their letterheads. Not too many people would do that, but the investment in this company when they rebuilt it was estimated around a million dollars investment, which would be somewhere in the 20, 25 million dollars in 2020 dollars. So it's a huge investment when they did this and then it burned. What a shame. Um, when Falk, Young, and Borkhart merged with Pabst in 1892, I mentioned that it catapulted Pabst to new heights. Pabst, at that time, by adding that capacity, was uh, the first brewer to exceed over a million barrels in sales in 1893. Um, here's another picture of a lithograph. Um, these are really huge lithographs, and they're super, super rare. This one was actually restored for the NABA uh, Museum, the National Museum in Potosi, Wisconsin. Um, so as we're getting closer now to have Andrew's part of the talk, I want to just briefly say, you know, what kind of beer did Falk brew? Well, almost exclusively, we know that Falk bottles are clear and they're embossed. They were bottled by A. Gunther. Uh, and then this year, I've believed my whole life that all of Falk's bottles were clear glass. And someone sent me an email and said, have you seen one of these? And I just about fell on the floor. Someone out east found this in a wall find. Uh, this Falk bottle, perfectly preserved, even includes the neck label. And the neck label has those two medals that they got from Mechanics Institute and Australia Exposition. So I thought that was really interesting. And we have some other evidence that Falk Slager was made from California barley and Washington hops. Um, uh, but lager was really what they brewed exclusively early on, especially. Uh, but it, we should note that Falk himself was from the Bach region in Bavaria. So here's some more uh, tidbits about Falk, including the ad that tells us what they make the beer. This is a California newspaper ad, really pitching how wonderful and pure Milwaukee is. Uh, and that if you're out in California, or the Washington Territory, you should pick some up. Uh, another label that's known out there. Uh, and then as we got right at the end of Falk's uh, brewing career, Falk Young and Borkhart, we know that they made a Salvatore as a style uh, and a select Pilsner. And um, I'm assuming this extra dry label is most likely that Pilsner. So today the Falk Brewery site itself is one of Milwaukee's oldest still standing structures at 1870. Um, on, unfortunately, even though there was a little bit of use after Pabst, for instance, Borkhart Maltine and LM Ribes Green and Malt used it as a malting facility and storage for a while. Uh, the hands of time have been unkind. Uh, the site accommodated a trucking and tire scrap company um, and they didn't invest anything. They just used it for space. Uh, about 2013, all of us historians out here in Milwaukee got very excited because a church partnered with the Menominee Develop Redevelopment Organization and proposed a really nice urban development of the site and the buildings. Um, they were really struggling to find investors, um, but they were going to use the stables as the church, and they did an early investment re-roofing part of the roof uh, we had a huge snowfall that 2014 winter that collapsed the roof and the new investment. And that really hurt them financially because the site needed a lot more than just that new roof. Um, also, later in that year, they were really looking at tearing down the building. The city had a raise order leveled against the previous owner, um, but a lot of concerned Amateur historians like myself and others lobbied the city successfully for historical designation so that it couldn't be just torn down uh, for the heck of it. Uh, and then we got lucky. In 2018, a new investor bought the property, and he had expressed an interest in turning the stockhouse into a data center. And I could have kicked myself because I came from a data and the IT side in my professional career. And if I had thought about turning the Falk building into a, a data center, I might have ended up buying that place myself. <laughs> um, but probably good that I didn't. 
at any rate, uh, uh, April 2018, I believe, or 2019, there was a fire. Someone had been trying to live in this little office building that was next to the main site, and they started a fire to keep warm inside of the wooden building with the wooden floor that was 150 years old. And the whole thing, uh, the wooden office building burned down. Um, but again, after the demolition of most of the Gettleman Brewery out at the Miller Coors site, uh, we really have one of the oldest structures still standing is still there. That 1870 stock house is still, still there and hanging in there. Um, because I've been to the site so many times, I thought people might just want to see some pictures of the, of the view. Um, the left is the stable building uh, back when it was still in one piece. Um, what you can't see from the image is that the floor has been filled in at least four feet deep and then cement poured onto the floor. If you're really close to the pillars in between those garage doors, you could see arches that are down about knee height. Um, and then the bottom left is like the side view on the left side. Um, the aerial view here is from today. So the fog house is still here. And you'll notice just to the right of the white roof, you can see some caved in roofing. The two original buildings from 1870 have their multi floors and roof caved in down on top of themselves. Um, but this stable building uh, on the far right, that's a picture of the roof uh, after it collapsed after the snow issue. And that really did in the stables. Um, what was interesting is if you looked around in that rubble pile, if you looked at one of the beams, like the one in the center picture top, it, the beam is scorched. It's a hand-hewn beam, uh, but it got scorched by the fires. Um, and then if you're inside the 50s era piece of that building, and look at the east wall from the inside, that's the graffiti wall on the top right. You can see the level of architectural detail they built into their stables. This is their stables, but look at the brickwork, the Cream City brick, uh, making those circle windows and all the details at the top. It was a really shame that they had to tear that piece down. Uh, that's a picture of the little white office building. It used to be just on the west wall, next to the west wall of the stock house. And the fire ruined all of this beautiful woodwork on the inside. Um, there were uh, etched glass buildings from Borkhart Malting inside of that office um, that got vandalized and crushed somewhere in the late 20 teens. And then the final uh, thing was the fire on the bottom left. That's an image from the fire, uh, which was the demise of that building. It's very unfortunate. And this is the Stockhouse building. Um, you don't really realize how enormous this building is until you're standing next to it. The bottom walls have to be six to eight feet thick. If you go in the, one of the first sections, the newest section, you're in this cavernous uh, space that is 100 feet tall, 100 feet in width, uh, and I don't know how far it is long. Uh, just a huge, huge uh, cavern. They used to have huge tanks, aging tanks in there. Um, and again, inside that part that collapsed, if you look at the uh, image here in the middle, um, that's from inside where one of the, the farthest left or the farthest collapsed building. Uh, those timbers have rotted to the point where they're like termite logs. So when we were in there, we're a little bit worried about those things falling down. Took a picture. I'm not sure why. <laughs> uh, and then people have been over time trying to get the cornerstone and steal it. Uh, but apparently, hopefully, no one has done that yet. Um, the bottom right image is a GPR image that one of my friends, uh, Kevin Cullen, created when he was doing an urban archaeology uh, study. And they show the green is underground something. So they line up with the uh, beer cellars that I'm about to tell you about. So 
Fortunately for us today, the Falk Brewery Ruins have produced one more success. Um, I was working part-time and continue to do so for Andrew, but I have a microbiology degree like Andrew. And I looked at him one summer in June and said, let's go on a yeast hunt. And I persuaded him to go and look around for yeast. And one of the places we ended up was getting access to these beer cellars. And we went in and we went on the two that are still there. Uh, hopefully they haven't caved in yet. Um, but that's a picture of myself and Andrew in the middle. And on the far right, uh, my friend Ron Thomas took a picture of us. Um, that's Eric and Andrew up in the in the middle. Um, but yeah, we were wearing hard hats, but it's sketch enough in there. I wouldn't recommend going in there. A hard hat really won't help you if there was a problem. Um, but this is where we gathered yeast samples. And I'm about to cut over to Andrew and his presentation. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, so good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Gearsack. I'm the uh, one of the co-founders and uh, I guess head brewer for Mobcraft Beer. Um, so as Dave mentioned earlier, uh, my background is in microbiology. I graduated from UW Madison in wow, 20, 2012 now already. Um, with microbiology. And then uh, not long after that, I ended up getting a job at Miller Coors, uh, working at the Lenny Kugels Brewery here in Milwaukee at 10th Street. Um, and then uh, not long after that, or a few years after that, uh, I went off and started, started Mopcraft. Um, so when Dave first approached me about this project, um, Dave, can you go to the next slide, please? Is that the one you want? Uh, can you go to the next one? Just going to anyway. chime in here that we're, this has uh, been a technologically Sorry. challenging uh, evening on all fronts, but uh, um, yeah. So. I can just keep talking. It's not a big deal. Andrew, which so, slide are you looking for? Uh, right now, all I can see is the fault glass slide. Um, I am. Oh, hang on. I have to. Dave, don't worry about it. I can just keep talking. So anyway, um, when first uh, when Dave and, uh, first approached me about doing this project, um, the original idea, I love the idea of trying to cultivate a historical uh, strain of yeast, which was what the project was all about. So Dave and I ended up going to a few different locations around downtown uh, Walker's Point, actually. And um, oh, here we go. Um, Dave, I'm just going to keep talking. <laughs> Okay. So anyway, um, yep, there we go. So there are the breweries. So uh, we went to a couple of different breweries and just tried to do some outdoor environmental sampling. Uh, we had little sterile swabs. Uh, they have little cotton tips and you just rub them all over whatever you want to try and culture microbes from. And then uh, we go from there. So if you want to go to the next slide, Dave. So those are some pictures of me uh, collecting samples around uh, random locations in Walker's Point. Um, we, if you want to hit the next slide. Uh, so yeah, we weren't able to cultivate any yeast, unfortunately, from all of these random outdoor locations. So um, next, Dave, being the uh, wonderful uh, historical curio that he is, uh, or curio collector, I should say, uh, managed to procure some uh, actual authentic uh, Schlitz and Pap sample bottles that actually dated to, I believe, 1888 and 1892, respectively? Yeah, 1887 and 1890. Ah, got it. Um, and so uh, we actually, uh, you can see in the photo there, uh, we actually managed to extract the beer with a syringe, and then I ran it through a filter 
And then uh, basically we put that filter on auger media and then we basically looked to see what grew. Um, unfortunately, uh, even though we were able to get beer, we even tasted it. It actually, uh, the one on the left uh, tasted like the finest sherry I've ever had. Uh, lots and lots of oxidation, but in a really great way. Uh, the one on the right uh, didn't taste so good. It was uh, uh, clearly a lighter beer, uh, while the one on the left was not. The one on the right was liquid cardboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, we were foiled again. Uh, Dave, if you want yep, next slide. So uh, we think the reason why this experiment didn't work was because they, um, Milwaukee Brewers, and uh, Dave, you can talk a little bit more about this briefly, um, but Milwaukee Brewers had started to pasteurize um, around the 1870s to the 1880s, correct? Correct. So they were pasteurizing the beer in the bottles, and um, basically we suspect that the beer that we got had been pasteurized, and so there would have been no way for us to get anything. Because that was the strange thing is like, I mean, there was some stuff growing in it, but there was no yeast whatsoever, which is really, really strange to not even pick up any yeast at all in beer. Um, so we decided to try again. Um, so we did our final pass, and that was the Falk Brewery. And as Dave mentioned earlier, uh, Dave managed to get the permission of the new owner of the building, and uh, we decided to uh, go on into the caves. Uh, if you want to keep going, Dave. So... These are the Falk Asian Caves. You guys have seen these some of these photos already. Um, what's really cool about uh, the cave that we were in was that it actually extended 80 feet into the hillside, and there was a 40-foot 40, uh, 40 stretch initially um, that was lower, and then there was a raised cavern about 40 feet back. And so you can see in that far-right photo, um, that's Dave on the bottom section. And then that's me and Eric up on top heading for as far back into the cave as we can, as far back into the hillside as we can. And the reason why I was really excited to go into the caves is because it's like, Oh, here's a place that is relatively isolated from human contact. So people haven't been hanging out there potentially contaminating it. Um, I mean, obviously some people have, but it's pretty dangerous in there. So I don't think people were just kind of hanging out there to hang out there. Uh, there wasn't too much sign of human presence. Uh, the other interesting thing is it was nice and cool. Um, so what's really interesting is um, microbes will actually uh, form spores. Most microbes will actually form spores in extreme conditions. Um, and they'll actually kind of come out of that, you know, spore, um, call it a coma, essentially, um, after they come into contact with water. Um, so that was sort of the whole premise behind the whole thing was even if there, even if beer hadn't been brewed down there for close to a century um, or more, uh, we were trying to figure out if there was anything still down there. And so we went in, we took swabs all over the place. I swabbed the bricks everywhere in there um, and we brought everything back to the lab. Dave, if you want to hit the next slide. So, we collected our samples uh, and then we had to select for them. Uh, and then after that, you played out the organisms that you isolate on your preferred media. In our case, it was wart. Uh, and then uh, if you were ultra rich and ultra fancy, then you could just run a genetic analysis with a PCR machine. Uh, but we're not that big or fancy yet. So we were just doing traditional verification. If you wanna hit the next slide, Dave. So this is a picture of the culture swabs that we used. Uh, Dave, if you want to hit the next slide. So uh, that, this is the next step, obviously, was taking our samples and actually putting them in Erlenmeyer flasks and running trial fermentations uh, to see if we could isolate and enumerate any organisms that, that we could physically plate out. Um, Ward is actually pretty selective media, so uh, it will, because of its pH and because of... Um, mostly because of the pH that selects for uh, specific organisms like yeast and lactobacillus because they can tolerate those circumstances better than some other organisms. Dave, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So this is what I was talking about earlier where I said I filtered it. Uh, this is a vacuum filter setup. So basically where that blue handle is that connects the funnel um, to the actual, uh, basically it's a blown glass plate, ground glass plate and then you put your filter over it, 
and then you hook it up to a vacuum and it sucks all the beer through this filter essentially. And this is able to filter out, you know, this is 0.4 microns. So this will be able to filter out any organisms in solution. And then we literally take those filter pads and put them on the little plates you see in front um, of the vacuum filter setup. If you want to go to the next slide, Dave. Brian. Um, so uh, basically, I tried and failed for a few weeks again um, to isolate yeast uh, to no avail. And uh, then things got really busy because then it was in the middle of summer and we were right in the middle of uh, making all of our lagers for fall uh, because our distributors want lagers in late August now. Um, so basically I had to shell the project. What I ended up doing was storing all of my samples in the fridge um, because when you're a microbiologist, that's a really great way to like just kind of store something and you don't have to worry about it for a week or two. And so uh, after a few weeks, uh, Dave changed the slide already. Uh, what I did was I looked at the bottom of the flask and there was actually yeast settled out on the bottom of the flask that had been sitting in my fridge. And then it struck me, it was like, oh, it was sitting in the fridge. It was sitting in the conditions that had already been living and thriving in underground inside of a beer cellar. Uh, so I managed to actually get that yeast um, onto plate and I was able to validate that it was a yeast. And um that's when I talked to Dave. So then we decided to do a small five gallon trial batch and that ended up tasting not awful. And so we decided to go for a full batch if you want to change the slide. So that was kind of the whole premise was we wanted to try and get one of these lager strains, uh, one of these pre pro truly pre prohibition style lager strains. Uh, next slide, Dave. Uh, so yeah, we just basically, next slide, Dave. So yeah, we, uh, basically produced a very simple beer and, uh, the first time we ever fermented it, we ended up fermenting it a little warmer for lager temperatures. Uh, we actually ended up starting it off at 60 degrees and it started blowing over and we started getting some phenolic characters. So we ended up having to lower it cause we weren't sure how this yeast was going to perform. Uh, because our first trial was a five gallon batch sitting in a homebrew cooler. Uh, trying to keep it at the right temperature. And uh, so this is the first time we had temp control. So we started it off higher and then it just rocketed. And then we turned it down 10 degrees, down to 55 degrees from 60. Uh, we started at 65, then went down to 60, then went down to 55. And the rate of fermentation did not change at all when we dropped down from 65 degrees down to 55 degrees, which means that that yeast did not care about a 10 degree drop in temperature at all. And it was like, oh, whoa, that's pretty cool. Um, so that was the very first trial batch that we did. And then ever since then, we've actually been dialing this in. Uh, one of the really interesting things about this yeast is that it uh, produces some phenolic character. But the other interesting thing, and this is the thing I really like about it, is that it's actually a very, very, other than this phenol, like this uh, mild phenolic character this yeast gives off, it ferments everything very, very cleanly. Um, I mean, Dave can attest, but this beer has a very, very clean malt profile to it. Um, and so just because of how this yeast is behaved, we are convinced we don't have any proof uh, from a genetic analysis, but Dave and I are convinced at least uh, with the evidence of our taste buds that we have isolated one of the original lager strains and not just a wild strain that might have been hanging out there. Yeah, and one thing that's important, if I might just add to that, is we know that that beer cellar was used for fermenting beer. So, you know, unlike some of the swabs we took on bricks by the train yard in Walker's Point, you know, the odds of us finding something brewery related in the beer cellar are pretty good, especially in something that hasn't been painted over or, uh, you know, updated, so to speak. It was still original conditions back there. Um, and all of us that brew who have tasted the yeast characteristics of this beer, um, and you can try it for yourself in gear beer, <laughs> uh, it has some really unique flavors to it that none of us have experienced before. I think if it was a lager beer that Mobcraft made, which, Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't make that many lager beers to begin with before uh 
The only other one that we did was our Oktoberfest, but this is the first year round lager we've ever done. So we don't have something at Knobcraft to make the mistake of finding something else. You know, it's really good evidence of what we sought out to Andrew was able to isolate. And kudos, by the way, Andrew, because that's a scientific uh, accomplishment of of the dreams of most brewers. We got to put up. We got to talk about getting published, Dave. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be awesome. Do we have more slides? So, um, so uh, that's that's pretty much it for the talk. Um, Dave, do you have anything else that you want to say? No, uh, I. I really think it'd be great if we could make a box someday. Um, I just dying to try this. Maybe I'll do a homebrew back to make a box. I'll use my Weizenbach recipe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just want to thank everybody. Um, given the amount of time frame we have here, I mean, Andrew and I could probably both talk to you for hours on these topics. Well, let's take a uh, well, first off round of a virtual round of applause for you guys. Thanks for uh for your knowledge tonight, um, you know, you, you mentioned at the beginning, Dave, that, you know, this brewery that produced a, a lot of beer over the course of many years gets overshadowed because they got kind of absorbed in consolidation. And, uh, um, and so it's, you know, we at the historical society like to point out these smaller examples or, or just not even smaller, but let less, uh, known examples of, uh, beer history too. Um, so I guess, I'll get it started out. So put your questions in the comments, everybody who's watching, um, because we'll have just a, you know, a few minutes for your Q and a here. Um, and there's a few questions I can point to too. Uh, I guess my first question though, is for Andrew, as far as yeast goes. Um, and this is, and, and so, so I homebrew and so you, you deal with yeast in that. And um, over this quarantine lockdown thing, you know, we like so many other people, did a sourdough starter. And so tell like, can you go into without like getting way into the weeds on science? How does, how does the, how, how do these different yeast differ? You know, cause I know like early home brewers, like they tried to brew with like bread yeast and it tasted like garbage. So is it just that these different strains just work better for beer or how does that work? So you're talking uh, specifically about sourdough. Well, sure. So sourdough, that's like you're getting the yeast out of the air, correct? And it just kind of... Well, you're getting... So that's so that's the really interesting thing is that um, with a sourdough, what you're getting is very similar to how people brewed for literally centuries where they would just leave it out and then they would let the air inoculate it. And it was the yeast and bacteria and other things that would basically get inoculated from the air, from fruit flies, from whatever... And that's how beer was fermented. It wasn't just a single organism. It was a whole mixture of organisms, similar to a kombucha scoby. Um, sure. It's actually very similar to how uh, traditional sour beer is produced as well. Okay. Um, so, so the sorry, uh, the question was specifically about um, how well, yeast how, 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 flavor. Yeah. How, how how did they? You know how how in the discovery of yeast did they say? This yeast works great for bread. This one works great for beer. Um, so that's the actually the really interesting thing about it is, so I was talking about how people basically just kind of inoculated it from the air. Well, over the course of centuries, people would literally just keep propagating it. And by virtue of uh, breeding, very similar to how we bred dogs, uh, we were able to breed strains of yeast that produce these unique different flavors and characters. Um, for example... Uh, lager yeast was actually produced, and they actually were able to prove this using uh, genetic analysis from a lab at my alma mater, UW-Madison, uh, that they were actually able to prove that about the way lager yeast arrived was that traditional Saccharomyces, which was the common widespread yeast used to ferment in Europe at the time, hybridized with a strain of yeast that was native to South America in Europe in like the 1300s or mm. some, like somewhere around there. I haven't... I am, I am gro like, I could be grossly misquoting that time scale, but like that's sort of the time frame when they think it happened was the 1300s to the 1500s. And that's where lager yeast and lager beer came from in Germany. Sure. Um, so that's, so the two broad categories, you were, uh, are lager yeast, obviously, which ferment cooler 
and ale yeast, which fermented warmer temps. Um, but basically, yeah, it, it basically came about through that process. And then Louis Pasteur was the one who actually sat down and had this crazy idea that maybe fermentation wasn't magic or an act of God, as had been thought pretty much right up until the mid 1800s. Louis Pasteur won the Grand Prix, or no, it wasn't the Grand Prix, but it was the Prix de France. It was some sort of prize. And he won 2,000 francs basically for proving that fermentation happened with organisms and not from magic. Hmm. And so that was when re things really got kicked into high gear. And this is where we move into the age of modern brewing, where we were able to isolate individual yeast strains. And then we're able to try all those different yeast strains and see how they work. Hmm. Uh, we've had about 100 years of that to basically figure out all these different yeast profiles and one thing about the bread, it's really interesting. I actually had a rep from Fermentis tell me that they were actually using brewing strains to make beer, uh, to make bread. It was actually making better bread than their turbo bread yeast that they sell. Huh. Uh, so that's so you were going, it comes, brings it right back to sourdough. You can use brewing strains to make bread and it actually can make some pretty tasty bread. Yum. Now I'm, it's getting to be uh, that time, isn't it? Um, so Logan's asking, uh, why didn't the lager beer stored in the barrels taste barrel aged? So obviously you barrel aged beer now and you put it in a whiskey barrel or a Chardonnay barrel or whatever, and it takes on that character. But what about the lager, like the beer barrels make that different back, you know, when that was the standard for the industry? Dave, I think uh, you're better, mm -hmm. far better equipped to answer that question. Yeah. So back in that era, uh, Barrel aging, the, the oak was actually pitched, uh, coated with pitch. Um, they had each brewer had their own special recipe, but they would coat the inside of the barrel, all of the wood surfaces where beer could seep into. They would coat that kind of as a, I don't want to say a preservative, but it kind of kept the beer from getting in the wood, so to speak. It also wasn't uncommon though for them to. Uh, take a couple of barrels on the side into unpitched oak barrels and age beer that way. So uh, the last time I was in Munich for Oktoberfest, they had some oak aged like spot, uh, just the regular Marzen or Oktoberfest beer they would sell, but aged in oak barrels. Uh, we did that at Mobcraft too. We aged uh, a quantity of Mobtoberfest in just a regular oak barrel. Um, the concept of beer, or I should say bourbon, or other kind of spirit-soaked barrel aging that we do in craft brewing today really wasn't uh, thought of, uh, at least not to the point where we know about it. I bet somewhere there was some crafty guy who made his homebrew batch and put it into a barrel formerly filled with whiskey. Uh, we just don't know about it. But they did absolutely... Uh, pitch the inside of the kegs in one of those fire maps i just showed uh the yellow building to the north of the brewery complex says pitching kegs in the fire map all right um okay one more question here and then i'll we'll get let everybody get back to their their world uh page i'm guessing this is about the yeast you have uh andrew but have you looked into getting it genetically analyzed i didn't know that was a thing Oh, thank, thank Lord! Thank the Lord! I uh, I was muted because I said an expletive as soon as I saw Paige Buchanan was on this uh, <laughs> on this call. Um, so yes, we have, and turns out it's really expensive. And okay. turns out, as Paige will as Paige will be able to tell you, a thousand dollars will go a lot further towards uh, brewing beer than it will towards getting your yeast analyzed. There we go. Uh, but that's. We've looked at it and like starting off, depending on what you're going for, they're, they have whole different ranges of options, but like one of the cheapest ones you could do, which would like tell you at least what class it's in uh, or what it's the most closely related to would be like $700. And then as you want more details about the genomic analysis, you have to pay more money. And you're like, it just tastes good. So we're going to just go with it tasting good. Yep, we're just going with it tasting good for now. Eventually, I would love to. We do have a PCR machine in house, but 
Uh, it's been years since I've had to design my own PCR protocols. So uh, I would need to get a professional in there to run, like basically to put together the primers and to put together the thermocycler protocol. Got it. Um, so I had read, uh, and then we'll, we'll get out of here in just a second, but I had read that there's, because I know Dave, you said, let's do a Bach with this. I had read something on Mobcraft's social media that there's being more done with this yeast than just gear beer right now. Um, yeah, we actually did a collaboration with uh, Working Draft in Madison, and we actually used uh, this yeast for their collaboration. So, uh, Paige, if you, uh, I don't know if you've had it already, but you should uh, go and get some if you can. Cool. Is it, so is that only going to be released in Madison, or can you get that in Milwaukee, too? Uh, we will be putting it on tap in Milwaukee. We have it in Milwaukee. I'm just not sure when we will be putting cool. it on tap. Well, that's something but, to look forward to. Well, everybody, uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, and, again, um, this will be available on our YouTube channel uh, after this, too. Um, but uh, thanks for tuning in next Tuesday. Uh, talk about people's beer and African-Americans and brewing during civil rights. And then um, we're getting away from beer. We're not just a, a beer historical society. Uh, we have uh, the origins of Summerfest a week from today, um, as Summerfest would have, uh, you know, was a, was a thing at one point. Um, but uh, thanks to Andrew and Dave for their knowledge and for this great presentation. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Thanks.